Okay, I suppose we can go ahead and get started with the next talk here. Uh, I'm Carl Bradley. I'm an extension plant pathologist. Uh, I'm here uh, at Princeton, and I work on uh, diseases of wheat, corn, and soybean for the most part. Uh, how many of you know Don Hirschman? I, was gonna, I would assume everybody in the audience would raise their hand. I replaced Don Hirschman uh, in July of last year, so I'm coming up on my, on my one-year anniversary. I'd known Don for several years. Uh, I was the extension plant pathologist at the University of Illinois for about the last uh, nine years. And then uh, when Don retired, I was able to, to come down here to UK uh, starting July 1. Actually spoke at this field day last year. I was, I was at that time, I was still a U of I employee, but, uh, but did speak at the, at the week field day last year. So this is my, my second one. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, diseases of wheat. Uh, I'm gonna mainly focus on uh, fusarium head blight or, or scab as we sometimes call it. Uh, although I'd be happy to, to take questions about other diseases. I know there's a lot of stripe rust uh, this year, at least in my trials and, and from what I understand across the state as well on some susceptible varieties. Also seeing some barley yellow dwarf uh, and uh, some septoria. Uh, moving up onto the flag leaf as well. So it's a pretty good year for diseases, uh, which is good insurance for, for a, a job like a plant pathologist, but sometimes it's not a good year for farmers, unfortunately. So we'll kind of see how everything turns out. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, fusarium head blight or scab is really gonna be the, the main topic uh, of my talk today. And any one of you in the audience could probably give this part of the talk, right? So I just want to show you what the symptoms look like. Symptoms, we usually have bleached heads out there. Uh, just because you're seeing bleached heads, does that mean it's scab that you're looking at? Is it automatically scab when you see bleached heads? No, not really. What else could it be? Take all maybe, some root diseases that, that kill off the roots and make that head die off a little early. Uh, there's some insects that can feed on the stem, killing the killing the head off, uh, so there's lots of things. So how can you distinguish between whatever and scab when you're seeing bleached heads? What can you look for when you're looking to see if it's scab? Pink color, that's right. What is that pink color that you might see? Anybody know? That's the actual fungus that you're looking at. It's the fusarium fungus that causes this disease. So here's that pink color right here, sort of that salmon pink color. You're gonna see that on the kernels. Uh, you know, sometimes it'll almost just glow out there. It can almost look like a neon kind of pink. Then you can, you can even see it from the road occasionally if it's, if it's that severe. What you're actually looking, looking at there when you see that pink uh, discoloration is the fungus itself. It's, it's producing a whole lot of spores in that area and you can see them with the naked eye. So that's what you're looking at. Is there anything you can do about scab at that point in time when you're seeing that pink discoloration in the kernels? Can you spray a fungicide? Can you do anything like that? Nope, there's nothing you can do, unfortunately. The damage is gonna be done. About the only thing that you might be able to do uh, if, you're, if you're looking and you have a lot of scab would be something that you could do at harvest. What might you be able to do to maybe get rid of some of those really, really scabby kernels? What could you do with the combine? You turn the fan up, that's right. Because some of the, the most severely infected kernels are gonna be very lightweight. They're gonna be those little tombstones. And those are also gonna be the ones that are gonna have the highest level of vomitoxin, of deoxynamalanol, or DON as we call it. DON or vomitoxin, it's the same thing. They're gonna be the ones that's gonna have the highest level, generally, of that toxin as well. And so if you can blow those out the back of your combine, you might be able to, to also lower the uh, vomitoxin while you're at it as well. Now, I know you're also getting rid of yield when you're getting rid of kernels, but there's been some work out of Ohio State University showing that when they did the economics on it, that it's actually better to get rid of some of those really scabby kernels in the long run uh, because you're gonna reduce the chance of, of high dockage and, uh, and maybe have a little bit better test weight as well. So if you do have a lot of scab, that's about the only thing you can do at that point in time. Um, so the big, really, you know, even though we can see yield reductions with scab, the biggest issues are related to quality. So we've got the vomitoxin that you may get docked for. At what level does, do elevators start docking you for 
vomitoxin. What what part per million? Anybody know? <laughs> In general, two parts per million is when you're going to start to see dockage, okay? And if you get up way beyond that, in some cases, that grain may be just outright rejected. So you want to try to keep your dawn levels below two parts per million. That'd be the best scenario. Uh, what other kind of quality issues might we see with, uh, with fusarium head blight? What about test weight? You see lower test weight when we have scab? You do? Yeah, you certainly do. That's another one to be that you can get docked for. So there's several ways that this disease can get into your pocketbook. So it's not just about yield, it's really most importantly in my opinion is about quality. Okay, I've got a picture of a corn stalk here. Why in the world would I have a picture of a corn stalk right here when I'm talking about a wheat disease? Anybody have any idea? What, is a, what does corn have to do with fusarium head blight of wheat? That's where it, that's right, it's, that's where it overwinters. This fungus actually likes a lot of different crops, believe it or not. And it causes uh, a couple of diseases on corn. We don't call it fusarium, generally, on corn. We call it gibberella, but it's the same fungus. So sometimes you might see a pink ear mold on, the, uh, on, your, on your corn ears. That's gibberella ear rot, it's the same fungus. In some years, we may have stalk rot that's caused by that fungus. And so this fungus does overwinter on corn, that's really probably where most of the of the inoculum, the spores, are coming from. And this isn't just any old corn stalk. Do you see what I have this arrow pointing to? All those little dots there? That's the actual fungus. This is what this fungus does when that corn debris is laying down on that on top of that soil surface in the springtime. We start to get a little wet, that fungus becomes active. It produces those little black structures that you see on that stalk. Those are called parathesia. And inside of those parathesia are the spores that cause infection on the wheat heads. Now, all these things have to come together to get fusarium head blight. So you have to have that inoculum here that's in that corn debris. What else? What about the wheat? Well, what stage does the wheat need to be at for, for infection to be able to occur? Anybody remember? Carrie kind of talked about it a little bit. Heading, that's right. Not just heading though, flowering actually. So it becomes susceptible once that wheat head begins to flower and it's actually susceptible all the way through grain development, believe it or not. But the most critical infections are the ones that occur the earliest and that would be right around flowering, okay? And so in, in years where we have a lot of fusarium head blight or scab, We've got this corn debris out there, we've got rain, and that made that fungus active, producing these parathesia. And at that same time, we've got the wheat heads that are fully emerged and beginning to flower, okay? What's the other missing component there that we need for scab to occur? Temperature. Temperature, what else? How about those wheat heads? Can they be really dry? Those wheat heads need to be wet, okay? So the, the other part about, about the weather is, is is wet weather, keeping those heads wet, and then not days like today where the sun's out, but overcast days where those heads are not going to dry off very quickly. Did we have some days like that this year? Did we, did we have uh, wheat flowering at that stage? We certainly did. So I think this year potentially could, could be uh, a, a bad year for scab, unfortunately, uh, and depending on what production practices were done to help manage this disease, we could have some, some issues with, with vomitoxin uh, with producers in western Kentucky this year. Yes? So the question is about the corn debris. Uh, what, what kind of tillage scenario might it be worse? Uh, certainly any, any debris that you have on the soil surface, that's where the inoculum is going to be coming from. However, this does not mean to go dig that moldboard plow out of, the, out of the ditch and start using it. It does not mean that. There's too many good benefits that we get from no-till to give that up, okay? But the one thing you need to keep in mind is whenever you are planting your wheat no-till into corn stubble, that the risk for scab is going to do what? It's going to be up. So that means when you're thinking about varieties, you need to be picking the most resistant variety that you can find. You also need to almost plan 
on spraying a fungicide for the most part. Okay, it's the odd, in my opinion, it's the odd year when we don't apply a fungicide for presidium head blight, actually. Okay, now one of the things that can help you make a decision on if you need to apply a fungicide for fusarium head blight or not is this risk model. And I handed out, and uh, Clint Hardy helped me hand out that, uh, that postcard there, okay? Now if you look at that postcard, it says something about scab alerts on it. This is something you can sign up for. It's free. You can sign up for these scab alerts. How many of, just out of curiosity, how many of you are already getting these scab alerts? Okay, I see a few hands. Actually, in the last trailer, nobody raised their hand at all, okay? so. But only a few did this time. So again, I'm going to make a real impact today. I would like all of you to sign up for that. It's not going to cost you anything. And what it's going to do is anytime I post commentary about SCAB on, that, on this website, you'll get an email, just one email, just saying that the, the commentary has been updated. And, that, and this commentary you're seeing is, is coming from me. And so what I'm talking about in that is kind of what my perspective is of the risk as well as some management practices, and I'll talk about maybe other diseases that we're seeing as well. So it's just another way to, to get a little bit more information on what's going on. Uh, here's the website right here, and uh, I'm sure many, most of you have probably been to this, right, this website. Raise your hand if you've been to this website. Okay, so a few more have been to this. If you haven't, it's a, it's a, it's a good tool. Uh, but what this does is it takes into account the weather, that occurred the previous five days. And this is basically weather that makes wheat heads wet. So it takes into account relative humidity, uh, temperature to some level, and also precipitation, how much, how much moisture has occurred those last five days. And it has this threshold then on all this, this model that, it, that computes, and it indicates if there's a low risk, which would be green, uh, or medium risk, which is yellow, or high risk, which is red. And you can see on, uh, this is actually from May 1st, when I did this, and you can see that part of Western Kentucky was, was under some pretty good risk at that point in time. Did we have flowering wheat in Western Kentucky on May 1st? We certainly did, we certainly did. So I think the, the risk map here is indicating that we may see some scab and that it was probably a good idea to spray as well. Now the other thing that you can do with this uh, map is you can actually look into the future a little bit. Okay, there's these buttons right here uh, the zero is based, if you click zero, that's going to give you the forecast based on the previous five days of weather that did occur, okay? If you click 24, that risk is going to be based on the weather the previous four days plus the forecasted weather for the next 24 hours and so on. So you can do that all the way up to 72, which basically means you're looking three days into the future. The, for, the, uh, the, the risk is based on the previous two days of weather and then what's forecasted for the next three days. So you, it gives you the ability to look into the future a little bit. This system is not perfect, okay? I'm not sure I'd be quite ready to, to put money on this system yet if I was a betting man, okay? However, I think it's a good indication of what's happening, all right? Now, in, in some years in, in the past, I think there's been some years where there was risk and it didn't indicate it. The good thing that's happening with this every year is the people that are developing these models are collecting more data and they're tweaking the model. So they're making it better every year. It's not perfect, but it gets better, a little bit better every year. Okay, so I'm going to shift over now and talk a little bit about management of, of uh, SCAB. Uh, what was the, the title of my talk today? Anybody remember? I didn't tell it to you, but it's on a piece of paper probably. It's something like uh, 309, 309 trials can't be wrong, okay? Where, how did I get that title? Well, I'll show you where that title came from. Oh, and I should mention right off too, I, keep, I, I mean to, to mention this right up front, and I, I've been forgetting, that all of my research on, on SCAP, Fusarium Head Blight, has been funded by two sources. One source is the uh, USDA Ag Research Service, uh, where they uh, have a program called the U.S. Wheat and Barley Scab Initiative. And that's a multi-state uh, project. Uh, it's funded through, through tax dollars, basically, uh, and uh, a very large area across the U.S., and all that money is devoted to looking at uh, managing fusarium head blight. So some of my, my support comes from that. The other part of my support comes from the Kentucky Small Grain Growers Association. 
And so if you were driving along the highway over here, and uh, and actually this field just all the way down to the end, have, have any of you been driving by and seeing the uh, the water running, the mist irrigation system? That's all funded by, by the, the groups I just told you, and that's to look at fusarium head blight. So one of the things that I have to do as a plant pathologist is I have to try to ensure that I'm going to have disease in my plots. So one of the things I do is I run a mist irrigation system to keep those weed heads wet in my plot so I'll have disease to, to be able to control. So that's what you're looking at over there. So as part of that, in uh, starting in 1995, the U.S. Wheat and Barley Scab Initiative began to fund a uniform fungicide testing program across several states looking at control of fusarium head blight. And what we're looking at here, what this, this graph, uh, this picture here is representing are 309 different trials that were conducted between 1995 and 2013. So this is a huge data set. And you can see where these different, where the data came from. Uh, the larger the graph, that meant the more trials that were conducted there. Uh, I did some work when I was at the University of Illinois, so did some of my predecessors. Of course, Don Hirschman here did a lot of work at Kentucky. Uh, Greg Shaner, and then, then followed by Kirsten Wise, did a lot of work at Indiana. So the soft red region is, is, is very well represented uh, in, this, uh, in this database. Um, and so what we try to do in these trials is we, we try to get a lot of scab in these trials. So we plant susceptible varieties, and we'll, we'll, we'll put moisture out, put water out there if we can, and we try to get a lot of disease. And so in total, there were 309 trials, but if you really start to put the numbers together, in each trial there were at least four replications, and there were at least probably a dozen different treatments. So there's really a whole lot of numbers we're looking at here. It's more than 309 when you start doing all the math. And if you're in the statistics, which I'm not, but unfortunately I have a good colleague at Ohio State University. Uh, his name is Dr. Larry Madden, and he took a lot of these, this huge database, and he did a procedure called meta-analysis, which is kind of the new, I guess, cool thing to do if you're a statistician. And what this allows you to do is take a very large data set and then look at individual treatments, even though some of the trials might have differed a little bit. And so that's what we were able to do with this large data set. We asked uh, some different questions and tried to answer it with this data set. So the first question we asked is which of these fungicides that we tested are the best for controlling fusarium head blight, the actual disease, but also uh, controlling uh, vomitoxin, the level of vomitoxin that gets a, uh, contaminates our grain. So we're looking, looking at two different things here. Uh, this graph over on your left is looking at percent control of the disease, so percent control of fusarium head blight. So what you're looking at here is the higher the bar, that meant the greater level of control that we had relative to our untreated check. Okay, so the higher the bar, the better level of control. Um, so basically what you're seeing here is we've got tebuconazole, proline, prosaro, and corumba. Tebuconazole, most of you probably still call that product or that active ingredient uh, folicure. That was the very first fungicide that we ever had for trying to manage fusarium head blight. In fact, uh, many extension plant pathologists uh, like myself and Don Hirschman had to work with our uh, State Department of Ags and EPA to request Section 18 emergency exemptions to have Folicure registered to use it on wheat. And I know that was the case in Kentucky for, for a number of years. Finally, back in about 2005 or 6, we were able to get some products fully registered for control of, of scab. It took a long time. So, the, so Tebuconazole, that's kind of the old standard. That's the one that, that uh, the only one we had for a while. But then we started to get new things, Proline, Prosaro and Corumba. Uh, Prosaro is actually a, a mixture of Proline and Tebuconazole. Okay. So what are you seeing from this graph? Are there three fungicides that stand out on this graph? Which one does not stand out? Tebuconazole. That's right. Tebuconazole, you're, you're not getting the same level of efficacy as you could with some of these better products. Okay. How about when we're looking at control of vomitoxin over here? Again, the higher the bar, the higher level of control. Do we see three products stand out over here? 
Do we see one that really dropped off quite a bit? So here's where it's really going to bite you if you're if you're using just a tebiconazole product, is especially with vomitoxin. We see about a 20% reduction in in efficacy of, compared to what we could have got with a different fungicide if we're just using tebiconazole. Why is it so tempting to use tebiconazole? Money, right? Tebiconazole you can probably get for maybe three dollars an acre right now. In some cases, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little less. So there is certainly uh, the temptation to spend a little bit less money and, and still get some protection, okay? But in a year like this, that can make a real difference. What's the other thing you notice when you're just looking at these in general? What kind of level of control can we achieve with just a fungicide? Is that all we need, just a fungicide? What's the best we're doing over here? About 50%, right? How about over here when controlling Dawn, vomitoxin? About 40%, right? So these that's not enough. I mean, if the only thing you're doing is spraying a fungicide but growing a susceptible variety, that's not going to be enough in those years that are really favorable for fusarium head blight, potentially a year like this year. Okay, so keep that in mind. Dr. Bradley? Yes. Do you know what the rate of Pissarro was that was in Six and a half ounces is what we looked The, the question was the rate of Pissarro that we looked at. Uh, we had some different rates, but what we did is we looked at this, we wanted to be sure we were looking at the same rate. Uh, because that you know rate difference could be a little bit different. So that's all looking at six and a half ounces of Persaro, and I believe it, 13 and a half ounces of Caramba, and the Proline rate maybe 5.7. I, I don't know that one off the top of my head. Uh, Tebiconazole would be four fluid ounces. Okay, so we also were able to ask some additional questions uh, using that data set. And uh, this is one that Carrie talked about a little bit, growth stages, right? So what we're looking at here are some different growth stages in which we applied the fungicide. Uh, the blue bar here would be Fix 10.5. What is that? You just had a, a primer on growth stages. What is Fix 10.5? Fully emerged. Fully emerged head, but not yet flowering, right? Or at least on 50% of the plants, right? And then we got Fix 10.5.1. That's early anthesis, early flowering. That's when you're first starting to see those anthers come out of the middle part of the head on 50% of the plants. Okay, so that's what we used here to call Fix 10.5.1 when 50% of the plants were at that stage. And then finally, this green bar is five days after what we called Fix 10.5.1. Okay, so we've got Prosaro over on your left, Corumba over on the right. And from looking at this, which is the best timing? Uh, this is control of the disease, of scab. Higher the bar, the better level of control. Which is the perfect timing on here? If you had to pick one timing, what would you do? Peaks 10.5.1, right? That gave the best level of control, Peaks 10.5.1. All right, now if you were to be a little bit off one way or the other, either a little too early or a little too late, but you couldn't hit that perfect date, which would you rather be, a little early or a little late? A little bit late, right? The data is showing that we do drop off compared to Feeks 10.5.1, but it's not as big of a drop off as applying early at Feeks 10.5. Okay. Now this is control of the disease. Over here, we're looking at control of vomitoxin. Again, what is the best timing for control of vomitoxin for the most part? 10.5.1. That's the perfect timing. Okay. If you were going to err on the side of early or late, which would be better? Late would be a little bit better than early, wouldn't it? Now, the interesting thing that we see when it comes to vomitoxin is that although we do drop off a little bit later, it's not the same magnitude of the drop off as we saw when we're controlling disease. So if you happen to miss, the, miss it just by a few days, within a few days, you may see a little bit more scab out in your field compared to if you would have hit it the perfect timing, but the vomitoxin levels might be similar. So, you know, whenever we have conditions that are favorable for scab, do we have conditions that are favorable for applying fungicides? Not always. We may have muddy fields, we may, it may be raining, so we can't always hit that perfect timing. But if you are still within a few days following that perfect timing, within about five days, 
I think it's still critical to go ahead and spray that field because you're still going to get a pretty good level of control of vomitoxin. You will drop off a little bit of scab, but this is really all about quality for the most part, and especially vomitoxin because that's really where your, your uh, dockage at the elevator is going to come from. And in some cases, you may not even be able to sell the grade if, you, if, you're, if your vomitoxin levels are too high. Okay, so I mentioned I have this, this disease, uh, this area down here at the end of this field where I do a lot of work on fusarium head blight. I call that my, my uh, scab nursery, okay? That's my scab nursery. Now, if you wanted to build your own scab nursery, I wouldn't suggest that you do this, but it, for some reason, let's just say you really like plant diseases, okay? And you wanted to build your own scab nursery, what would be the things that you would do? What would you do? What do you see when you're driving along the highway? Sometimes the you see water shooting around, right? So you'd, you'd want to try to keep those heads wet somehow. And so that's what we're doing over there. Okay, so what else? What kind of variety would you plant? A susceptible variety. Okay, what did you do? Anything else? No-till? Okay, no-till into what? in the corn stubble, okay, inoculate, okay, that's cheating, but you could do that too, okay. All right, yeah, so you would do all those things, right? Okay, and so that's basically what we've done down there. Don't do what I do, okay? Don't do what I do. You don't wanna have a scab nursery on your farm, okay? So what I've done, this is actually some work that I conducted when I was at University of Illinois, but I think it's relevant to, uh, to Kentucky as well, is I looked at integrating some different management management practices in trying to, to manage fusarium head blight. And this is over some different locations, over a few different years. And everything, this is actually percent control of vomitoxin. I didn't put the, the dawn up there, but it's percent control of vomitoxin. So the higher the bar, the higher level of control we achieve. Everything is relative to doing it all wrong, okay? To having a scab nursery. Now, the only thing we didn't do is we didn't, this was all relying on mother nature for the weather, okay? We didn't, we didn't inoculate and we didn't uh, mist irrigate these trials. So it was all the nature. But everything is relative to the worst case scenario, which would be planting a susceptible variety into corn stubble and not spraying a fungicide, okay? So if you look at this first bar, this is our susceptible variety without a fungicide, but we plant it into soybean stubble. And so what you can see is that we did get some level of control just by following soybean instead of corn. Okay, not a whole lot, but a little bit better control. Now one thing to keep in mind is just because you're planting into soybean stubble, does that mean that you're not going to have any corn stubble in that field? No, you're probably going, especially if you've been no-tilling for a long time, you're still going to have some corn stubble out there. Your neighbor may still have a lot of corn stubble, so there's still inoculum that's going to be coming. But you can reduce it a little bit by, by planting into soybean stubble. Okay, this next bar, uh, we were able to uh, plant the susceptible variety into corn stubble, but the only thing we did is we sprayed a fungicide. So we got 36% control. That kind of lines up with what we saw down here, where we had about 40% control of vomitoxin. We're kind of still in that same ballpark. This next bar, we still have the susceptible variety, but this time we planted it into soybean stubble and sprayed a fungicide, and we're able to get it up to about 45% control of vomitoxin. All of these orange bars here, these are all moderately resistant varieties, the most resistant varieties that we can find. That alone, you can just see the jump from the orange to the, the blue, that alone is highly significant. So if there's only, if you're only gonna do one thing, for managing fusarium head blight, plant the most resistant variety you can. That's the most important thing you can do, okay? And so basically that's what you're looking at here is the effect of the resistant variety. This is resistant variety in the corn stubble without a fungicide. Then we have our resistant variety without a fungicide but into soybean stubble, so a little bit more of a bump. And then we have here our resistant variety with a fungicide. So that's probably the best combination, things that you can do, resistant variety with a fungicide, up to 82% control. And if we did that and planted it into soybean stubble, we bumped it up a little bit more. So we can get almost to 90% control whenever we put these different tactics together. And the most, two, the most important two things here are the variety 
and then the fungicide at the right timing, okay? But another thing that's important is how are you applying those fungicides, okay? What is our target whenever we're applying a foliar fungicide to try to control fusarium head blight? What is the target on the wheat plant? Is it the leaves that are maybe kind of flat? Where is fusarium head blight causing infection? In the heads. This is the target right here, right? Something that's vertical. So it's a little bit different than spraying a herbicide and trying to get, you know, get the, the weed leaves covered, right? It's a little bit different than that. So the nozzles that you're using are very important, okay? This year, uh, with funding from the uh, Kentucky Small Grain Growers Association, one of the things that we're looking at are some different nozzles. Now, my old standby standard that I've been using for about the last nine years or so when I've been doing scab trials is this twin jet nozzle here, okay? I don't know how well you can see this, but it's called twin jet for a reason. It's got twin jets, two nozzles. One's kind of oriented this way, the other one's that way, okay? So you have an, an angled nozzle about like that where the spray pattern's like this, and so the idea is that you're hitting the wheat head more on this kind of an angle, so you'll get more of that wheat head covered, okay? Even though these fungicides are a little bit systemic, coverage, there's not much systemicity within the head, so coverage really is important. So we're looking at some different configurations. There's been some work out of, um, uh, out of Canada where they've looked at some different nozzles, and, and this kind of orientation with some flat fan nozzles has been, a, has been something that they've seen as well as, as being pretty good. Uh, they're also using a flood jet nozzle uh, where, I don't have that one on here, but they have a flood jet nozzle oriented forward and then on the next spot on the boom is oriented backwards. So they've seen pretty good results with that. A couple of things that we're evaluating this year that as far as, my, as, far as I'm aware of, nobody else has evaluated is this new air induction nozzle, which also has a two spray pattern from T-Jet. This is another nozzle. I don't remember who makes it. It's not from T-Jet. But I, when I went to the uh, Ag Spray store to get some of these nozzles, I said, well, here's what everybody's using. <laughs> so we're evaluating this as well. But what you can see with all of these is you've got some kind of pattern where you've got a front pattern and a back pattern. Okay? So it's important to try to get the best coverage that you can.